In the middle of the 1980s, I used to live in a terraced house with my former wife, our young son, and my stepchild. We shared our home with a lodger named Pete Johnson, a truly kind-hearted fellow. Staying in that terraced house was an unusually eerie and gloomy experience. It felt as if something was dwelling there, thriving on negative emotions such as anger and despair, the typical conditions you'd expect in a haunted house. Yet, this place was unique. I've had experiences with haunted houses both before and after that, but none were as malevolent as this one. Once, I questioned Pete about why he always slept with the lights on in the basement. Pete, a man in his late 40s or possibly early 50s, was quite embarrassed, but eventually admitted that he was terrified of sleeping in the dark due to the figure he sensed watching him from the dark corners. I believed him. It was simply a dreadful place. You'd hear noises from upstairs or the kitchen, only to find no one there when you went to check. The occurrences weren't terrifying as such, but they were definitely odd, making it feel like the house was inhabited by something not entirely human, or at least something that had never been human. One winter's night, I was heading out to work the graveyard shift. It was a typical snowy November evening in Toronto. Walking down the snow-covered street, I was deep in thought burdened by the weight of responsibilities not typically shouldered by a 23-year-old. By this point in my life, unlike many guys my age, I had already served in the Canadian military. I traveled solo to six different countries and had even ventured along the East German border, witnessing miles of barbed wire and electric fences stretching endlessly across the landscape marked by a field of landmines. Additionally, I was a married man with a son and held a steady job with a labor union. So I wasn't your average 23-year-old. As I walked, a man suddenly came around the corner further up the street. He moved rapidly, almost mechanically. I remember it as if it happened just yesterday. The guy appeared to be in his late 40s, sporting a gray trench coat cinched with a rope at the waist. He was incredibly thin, almost skeletal, and wore glasses. Without any warning, he began advancing towards me at a brisk pace. But I wasn't overly concerned. I was a veteran, after all, capable of defending myself. However, this man approached me extremely quickly. As he passed by, he gave me this wicked, sinister grin. Suddenly, I felt this chilling sensation, like the iciest shard you could ever think of, piercing deep into my chest, even though he hadn't physically touched me. I remember falling to one knee, gasping for air. The cold was overwhelming. It's something I can't adequately describe. Even today, on rare occasions when I feel threatened, I can still feel that chilling sensation in my chest, as intense as it was back then. When I turned around to look at the man, he had vanished. He left no footprints or any trace that he'd been there. He had simply disappeared. Years later, after my divorce, I was living with my son and decided to seek advice from the Warrens. For those unfamiliar, Ed and Lorraine Warren were renowned paranormal investigators at that time. Back then, you could actually find their phone number and call them directly. I spoke to Ed first, with Lorraine also listening in on the conversation. I summarized my experiences far more briefly than this narrative because Ed requested conciseness. After about 10 minutes of conversation, Ed reassured me that I wasn't losing my mind and that I'd had an encounter with a demon, a malevolent spirit that was envious and had never been human. There was no exorcism drama. It was just a terrifying encounter with an intensely envious demon. Ed suggested that the demon was jealous because I was young and alive, something it had never experienced. When I was moving out of the house, I warned the new tenants, a gay couple, about the house being haunted. Of course, they dismissed my warning with a skeptical roll of the eyes. But as I was later told by a neighbor down the street, they abruptly moved out just four months later in the middle of the night without any explanation. To this day, this story is one of the two most horrifying encounters I've ever had with demonic entities. I'm a proud member of the Metis indigenous Mi'kmaq people from northern New Brunswick, Canada. Are these phenomena real? 
Yes, my friends, they certainly are. Before tying the knot, I was living solo in a tiny dwelling. It was a one-level house with a couple of bedrooms, and it was a standalone building. It also had a good-sized backyard. It was definitely more room than I needed, but my job was going well, so I could cover the cost. It was an insanely high price, just a bit more than I needed. One evening, after a really long workday, I got back home later than I usually do. It was about 10 at night. I parked my car in the driveway and headed towards my front door. As I made my way in, I felt wiped out. I had had an extremely long day, and I was all set to hit the sack. As I walked into my house and flipped on the light, I was floored by what I was looking at. I'd walked into a total mess. My stuff was all over the place, and it was clear that someone had forced their way in. I froze there, shocked for a moment, and then I heard loud stomping from another room. My heart almost stopped because it sounded like the burglars were still inside. I thought that if I could hear them, they probably heard me too, because soon after, I heard my bedroom door slam. I was certain they were in there. I was slightly relieved they didn't confront me. I quickly and quietly retreated. I stepped out the front door and hopped back into my car. I was slightly glad that I didn't have to come face to face with them. Who knows what they could have done if I had. I fired up my car and drove off. As I was driving, I noticed an old black Ford pickup truck that seemed out of place. It was an older design with just the two front seats and an open trunk. I was familiar with all my neighbors, and it was uncommon to see a car I didn't recognize. I figured it might belong to the thieves, but I didn't think to jot down the license plate. I parked on the side of the road a few blocks down and called 911. The pickup truck was still visible in my rearview mirror. I told the operator what happened. I was fumbling over my words. I sat there waiting for a bit, and then out of the blue the pickup truck started up. Its headlights zoomed past me as I was sitting there waiting. Just a minute later, the police showed up. They combed the house carefully, but it was empty. That's when I told them about the truck. The police started a search based on what I had told them. I spent the night at a hotel and didn't go to work the next day. It was a very scary incident. Some of my belongings were gone, but I didn't own a lot of pricey stuff. What really got to me was that they took a watch that my grandfather had given me. It wasn't expensive, it just meant a lot to me. Apart from that, they had taken a few hundred dollars in cash. There was a broken window where they had gotten in. The police managed to catch the burglars a few days later and I got my belongings back. I was quite shaken up by what happened and it took me a few months to feel safe in my home again. I ended up installing some cameras and a security system after that. My name is Alex and my spouse, Kara, and I just moved into a rental in a friendly community. We didn't know an experience like this was ahead of us. Our new home was a one-story house on a corner lot. It was smaller than we had hoped for. There was no garage and only room for one car on the driveway. That meant one of us had to park on the road. We understood that we would need a bigger place eventually, but for now, it was sufficient. The house had a quiet suburban charm but was still close to a major bus route, so it wasn't all terrible. We settled in on the first weekend of June last year. Our landlord, Carl, came by and handed us the keys. He even assisted us with some of our moving boxes. He was a peculiar fellow, maybe about a decade older than me, or perhaps a bit more. I was 29 at the time, so he was probably in his early 40s. He was an incredibly reserved guy, uncomfortably so. Being an introvert myself, I understood, but Carl was really something else. He was a bit heavy, had long black hair, and wore glasses. Every time I saw him, he was in a plain white t-shirt. For the first few weeks, everything went smooth. However, one Sunday morning while having breakfast, Kara brought up that she had heard odd noises during the night. I was taken aback because I hadn't heard anything, and I'm usually a light sleeper. We talked it over. I was hoping it was nothing serious, but Kara felt certain that there was someone in the house. Even though I didn't hear anything, I trusted her instinct. 
Eager to calm our nerves, I decided to speak with our landlord, Carl, about it. I contacted him and explained the situation. I proposed that we set up security cameras in the house. It seemed like the simplest way to address the issue. But to my shock, Carl flatly said no. He claimed it would cause harm to the house. I thought his reasoning was absurd. What harm could a few tiny holes do? The house was not exactly fresh off the market. It was fairly well maintained, but it certainly wasn't a luxury residence. I didn't think he would even notice if we installed the cameras. I only asked to be polite. I figured then that I didn't need his approval after all. I was capable of fixing any holes left by the cameras when we moved out. At worst, we might forfeit our security deposit, and I was okay with that. After discussing it with Kara, I took charge of the situation. We both agreed on the next steps. I explored different security systems, and despite our landlord's objections, I went ahead and installed them carefully throughout our home. Nothing unusual happened for the first few days. I reviewed the footage every morning, but it was all clear. We were beginning to believe that maybe it was all just in our minds, since nothing was actually missing the night Kara heard the sounds. One morning, however, neither of us had heard anything the previous night, but I thought to check the camera recordings on my phone regardless. What I saw on the display sent chills down my spine. There, in the poorly lit hallway, was Carl, our landlord. He was creeping down the hall, his eyes locked on our bedroom. As he approached, I switched to a different camera. He peered his head into our room and stayed there for nearly 20 minutes. I had to speed up the video, it was so eerie. Shock and rage engulfed us as we watched. We immediately called the police and Carl was arrested on several charges. After the incident, we had to vacate the house because it was part of a criminal investigation. We rented an Airbnb for a bit until we found a new home. Eventually, we discovered that Carl had secretly installed cameras around the house as well. All of it was used as proof against him for his crimes. In the end, he was given a seven-year jail term for his actions against us and other tenants in that house. We never saw him again, and I hope it stays that way. My name is Will, and I stay in a neighborhood close to my parents. We live not too distant from a big city, yet also nearby some quiet country roads. My buddies and I would often spend time riding our bikes around the area. We always knew how to get back home because there were only a couple of main roads and a few smaller ones branching out from them. Once you reached a main road, finding your way back was a piece of cake. One bright day, my friends John, Garrett, and I took a bike trip. We'd visited most of the local spots, but this time we pushed ourselves to go further than we ever had. As we were cycling, we noticed a solitary house standing on the road's edge. The worn-out look and the overgrown weeds around the house gave us the impression that it was empty. The empty fields around it supported our suspicion. Our curiosity was piqued, so we decided to take a closer look. We parked our bikes on the roadside and walked towards the lonesome house with careful steps. The weeds were so tall and thick, we couldn't ride through them. Getting closer, we realized that the house was a complete wreck. Garrett suggested going in. He was always the most daring of us all, but John and I didn't agree to his plan. Garrett quickly gave up on his idea, probably knowing deep inside that it wasn't the smartest move. The house was in such a state of decay that it looked like just pushing the door would bring the whole structure down. All the windows were gone, with not a single shard of glass in sight. The roof was missing many of its shingles, too. Even though we had decided not to enter, we were still intrigued. We thought we might at least take a peek inside. Garrett, who was always the bravest among us, walked up to one of the empty window frames and peered in. John and I stood at a safe distance watching him. The moment Garrett looked inside, he quickly turned around and bolted back towards us, his face as pale as a sheet. Then Garrett threw up right there on the ground. John and I were at a loss for words. I asked him what he had seen. With a shaky voice, he told us that there was a corpse inside the house. His words hung heavy in the silence. None of us knew how to react. Garrett, despite being the bravest among us, wasn't known to lie or play pranks. 
John and I didn't doubt him for a second. Neither of us had the courage to look into the window to confirm it, though. We started cycling as fast as we could, resolved to get home and report what Garrett had seen. As the sun began to set, our shadows stretched long on the road. I rushed into my house and relayed the entire story to my parents. At first they seemed doubtful, but they decided to call the police anyway. When we described the house, the officer immediately recognized it. Turns out it was notorious to them because it was a frequent spot for criminals and drug dealers. I was astonished that anyone would dare to enter that dilapidated house. Maybe it wasn't as precarious as we thought. When the police conducted their investigation, they discovered a man's dead body. The body was so decomposed that they couldn't identify him or determine the cause of death. Days turned into weeks with the ongoing investigation, yet the identity of the deceased man stayed unknown. The discovery sent shockwaves throughout our neighborhood, leaving everyone on edge. Rumors and conjectures swirled around, but the truth remained an enigma. Life eventually regained its usual rhythm, but the memory of that disturbing day was etched in our minds. The house stood there as a chilling reminder of our gruesome discovery. I thought it should be demolished, but the decision wasn't in my hands. The house still exists there in the same place to this very day.